Hello, everyone. I see everyone coming in here. We're going to let everyone uh, get all in and tucked in before we get started with April. I appreciate you guys coming and getting started on our little week-long uh, annual meeting extravaganza. I'm not really sure how many we got here right now. I'm going to wait a few more minutes. <clears throat> hey, everybody. How's it going? Okay, it looks like, I guess, well, no, there's still some more coming in, so I'm going to wait just a second. I don't want anybody to miss a thing. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I would, uh, let me close that out. Okay, so I would like to uh, welcome you all to our first webinar as part of our annual meeting uh, week of events. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a few housekeeping items for a better streaming experience. Please close all other web browsers. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on Mars YouTube channel. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by Mars Title Gold Preferred and Premier Sponsors. And we're gonna have them up on screen so make sure you use our sponsors who uh, support us um, I'm excited to be able to introduce you to our speaker today April Childs Potter is the chief marketing officer with the Greater Memphis Chamber over the past 17 years April has worked to bring a data-driven approach to some of the Greater Memphis region's biggest civics projects April is a champion for all things Memphis, yay, and I cannot wait uh, for you to hear what she has to share with you today. Uh, feel free to send in any questions in the Q&A feature or in the chat, and we'll do our best to um, address them after the presentation. So thank you for being with us today, April. I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to skedaddle out so you don't have to look at my beautiful face during your presentation. <laughs> Thanks. All right, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. I can't see you, so I can't tell. Um, well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, as uh, I'm April Childs Potter, as that great intro said, I'm the CMO at the Greater Memphis Chamber. I like to say that that stands for Chief Memphis Officer. Um, they wouldn't let me have the title of head cheerleader, but that is what I've asked for. Um, so I'll just get started here. Let's see. All right. Um, and I'm just playing a video from our friends at Memphis Tourism in the background to just remind you of all the great things, the assets that we have and the things that hopefully we'll be able to go and enjoy in a more normal way here soon. Um, long known as the home of blues, soul, and the birthplace of rock and roll, Memphis is also the birthplace of innovations like the world's first hotel chain, the world's first hotel chain, the uh, first self-serve grocery store, um, as well as we're the city that invented the concept of overnight package delivery, which who knows how important that has become to us over the past six months. Uh, but today our companies are even more innovative than ever. We have companies that are creating technologies to make sure that our musicians are paid appropriately for the rights to their music across the internet. We have companies that are working to solve some of the world's most difficult food challenges. And one that's really near and dear to my heart, uh, we're the epicenter for life-changing uh, medical innovations that uh, work to ensure that no child's life is cut short by the threat of cancer. Memphis has changed the world and the world is really starting to take notice. In fact, uh, last fall, you may remember the show uh, Bluff City Law on NBC. Unfortunately, it was not picked up for a second season, but what was really exciting about that show is that 
it uh, really showcased something very cool about Memphis. The entire premise of Bluff City Law was that Memphis is a place for people who want to change the world. Uh, that's not advertising that I can buy no matter how big my marketing budget is. Uh, so we're really excited that Memphis is really getting elevated on a national stage in so many ways as a brand um, that means more than, than, than just what we thought before of maybe a sleepy town in the river. Memphis is really elevating its profile. Um, I'm really fortunate to join you guys today. I did speak to the, the leadership group uh, late last year in what we called the before COVID, the BC Times. Um, and shared a little bit of what I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, so I'm excited to be invited back. Um, we have had so much change since last fall, but I can assure you that um, your partners at the, at the Greater Memphis Chamber and others across the city are working to make sure that despite the uncertain times that we're in, that our city is well positioned to thrive in the future. So I wanna to start today to just talk a little bit about the Chamber and what we do. Uh, our primary mission is to make sure that our region is economically prosperous for everyone in it. Uh, we do that work by uh, four kind of key buckets. We work to attract new investment to bring those new companies and their jobs here to Memphis. We work with our existing companies to grow their business so that they can employ more people. We work with our partners in the university and training centers to build a strong talent pipeline so that our companies can have the workforce that they need. And we also work from both a policy and infrastructure perspective to strengthen our business climate here in, in West Tennessee to make sure that uh, our region is conducive for job growth. Now, my part of that is I get to wrap all that up and tell the great story of our city. And it, and it is a really exciting one. So I'm gonna share a little bit about what that story is with you today. Over the past decade, uh, we are, have, have um, sort of stayed the same size-wise as a region. We are about 1.3 million region, region, uh, regional residents in the metropolitan area. Uh, over the past 10 years, we've had about a 10% increase in millennial population. And one statistic that we're extremely excited about is that in 2019, Memphis uh, became a million visitors on average per month market. Uh, now, COVID is certainly going to impact that, but we think that that momentum is really important because what we find with the next generation of workers is that visiting a city is really the first step in them considering a move to that location. Uh, so we think that's really positive momentum. Our location is a really critical part of our sales pitch when we're talking to companies. We are the economic hub of a seven state region. Uh, most people think about Mississippi and Arkansas as our neighbors, but really uh, part of our Mid-South region includes Missouri, uh, Alabama, Illinois, and part, Illinois and part of Kentucky. In fact, for 150 miles in every direction, we are the biggest metropolitan area. Uh, when you look at that 150 mile footprint, there are 5 million people that live in that region. Uh, and we are the unofficial capital city of that Mid-South region. Uh, I talked about the world taking notice of this. Uh, you can see here just small sampling of the national media that we're getting. Uh, we're being called everything from the next Austin to the next Charlotte. Of course, we in Memphis just like to say we're Memphis and nothing else is like us. Um, we were also featured last May in a Facebook social media commercial. Um, and you're just going to really begin to continue to see Memphis pop up on a national stage. That's no accident. About uh, three and a half years ago, the Chamber, as well as our partners, at the city and tourism and many others came together to create the Memphis Brand Initiative. That is a group that is solely focused on elevating Memphis's profile, particularly with young diverse talent, uh, those multicultural millennials that we hear so much about. Uh, we have a really strategic effort underway to elevate Memphis's profile as a place for those folks um, and to really do that both through digital media, traditional ad spends, as well as a really aggressive public relations campaign. And so some of the stories that you see here are part of that effort. Another big story that we have is that we have $19 billion invested in major revitalization projects since 2014. Now, I mentioned before, Memphis has not grown population at the rate that some of those big it cities like Nashville and Charlotte and Austin have, but our investment numbers over the past couple of years have really, really uh, accelerated and they've garnered lots of national attention. 
Uh, we like to say that this is because Memphis has started to invest in itself, and you'll hear throughout this presentation the theme of investing in Memphis. Uh, the world may not have known that we were here doing this work, uh, but we've really accelerated and we're on a national stage now, so that's exciting. Uh, of course, you'll hear me talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted these things, but one of the things that we think positions our market really well moving forward is that a lot of the projects that we have in the pipeline are underway, which means that we did not anticipate revenue. Those projects were meant to be efforts that were offline and in progress during this time. We think that that's going to help us when COVID is over and things begin to return to normal because those assets will be coming online just as people are getting ready uh, to, to really get out there again. So that's exciting. One of the other things that's a real driver of our story is our cost of living. Despite the increased investments in our city, we've been able to really retain this asset. I'm sure you hear this from clients frequently who are relocating from other cities. Memphis, we update this statistic each quarter, is about 20% lower cost of living wise than the national average. Uh, we used to say that this was really critical to millennials specifically because uh, they wanted to be able to create the kind of life um, that they imagine. So it might be, I want a bigger house, or it might be I want to live right in the core of the city, Memphis offers all of that. And we think that that particular advantage is going to be even more critical coming out of COVID. In fact, a lot of the data that we're seeing is that um, reversing a little bit of a trend that we saw with millennials and Gen Z, which is the group that comes behind millennials, um, that they are becoming a little less interested in those micro apartments and those um, in not owning a home and some of those trends that we heard about for a long time, we think because of COVID that's gonna reverse. Uh, in fact, as you can imagine, that 400 square foot uh, studio apartment in Manhattan is a little less attractive when you literally have to be inside of it all day long. And so as we're talking to companies, particularly those with some operations here that are thinking of expanding, uh, they're hearing from their workforce that they want to be in a market where they can be close to the, to the urban core, close to those amenities, but maybe have a little bit more space. And certainly Memphis offers that in spades. We are one of the only metropolitan markets um, that offer the kind of housing stock options, such a wide variety within um, such a short distance of our amenities. Uh, in fact, we talk a lot with prospects about the fact that in Memphis, 30 miles is 30 minutes. And that's a real asset to someone who is moving out of a place like DC or uh, even Atlanta where commute times can be really crushing. I do wanna just touch on some of the COVID indicators that we're watching. If you are signed up for our newsletter from the chamber that comes out weekly, every other week you'll see this indicators to watch report that comes out. It's really just helping us understand where we sit in the market. Uh, this report came out last Friday um, just a couple things that I'll note. Our unemployment rate um, did rise up a little bit over the last month. Um, we, are, uh, we feel pretty confident about those numbers because Memphis retained the lowest unemployment rate through the thick of, of the COVID um, closures and shelter at home orders. So we're, we're expecting this number to creep up and, and kind of regulate out over the next couple of months. Um, that second indicator you see is just month over month job change. And so tracking that up for the full month. We saw about 3,800 job postings come online. So we're back to about 35% of the jobs we lost we're seeing come back, which we think is a positive sign. Um, those initial unemployment claims month over month um, have, have risen, but we did see a pretty significant, I think about a 22% drop off in, in uh, reoccurring unemployment claims. And so what that tells us is a lot of folks that were maybe sitting out of the job market with the extra $600 a month um, incentive have, have probably re-entered. And so we'll start to see these numbers change because of that. Again, healthy uh, weekly job posting growth and things like that. Our consumer confidence did week over week dip just a little. We anticipate that to happen as school starts back and, and things start to get um, regulated out. But again, um, while these numbers are concerning in a normal time, we think compared to where we're benchmarking against our peers in the national level, we're doing quite well. I want to talk a little bit about some of our strategy for the types of businesses that we're recruiting. This is obviously important to you because the folks that we recruit to these businesses mean more workers in Memphis. And so hopefully you'll be seeing the benefit of that by lots of new prospects um, to, to housing. 
Uh, our economy actually supports, it's the largest support system for the state of Tennessee. We contribute $58 million, million dollars to the state's economy, which makes us the largest contributor in the state of Tennessee. Uh, so take that, Nashville. Um, we have uh, three Fortune 500 headquarters here in Memphis. Uh, a fun fact, in the state of Florida, Miami is the only other city, is the only city in the state of Florida with three Fortune 500 headquarters. Uh, we also have St. Jude Children's Research Hospital uh, headquartered here. Because of their partnership with the World Health Organization, uh, that really has helped elevate our business profile as well. Um, FedEx is another one that really helps elevate our profile because they're continuously named one of the best companies to work for. Uh, some other names that you know, um, these are all companies that are, there are large significant brands um, known the world over that have a presence here in Memphis. I like to call attention to a couple. One is Indigo Ag, which is the startup darling of 2018, 2019. They were named one of the world's most disruptive companies. They are dedicated to innovating in the field of agriculture uh, and changing the way the, the world gets its food. Um, it's really exciting that they decided to locate here in Memphis. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But some other names, um, Smuckers, uh, Amazon, of course, Microport. Um, and then I also like to note that Nike's second largest um, campus in North America is here in Memphis. In fact, often if you go and look at the back of your Nike shoe box, they often say um, made in Memphis, Tennessee, or shipped from Memphis, Tennessee, which is kind of exciting. Uh, when we talk about the assets that we sell every day, we talked about that geographic location. Well, the geography wouldn't matter if it wasn't for our infrastructure. Uh, we like to talk a lot about the four R's, and those are railway, our, our runway. We are the second busiest cargo airport in the world. Roads, we're the third busiest trucking corridor uh, in the country. We have five class one railroads. In fact, Memphis is the only place in the state of Tennessee where all five of those class one railroads converge. I can attest to that. I live in Midtown and I, I hear those trains going by, 88 of them a day uh, in Midtown Memphis. We're also the fifth largest inland port in the U.S. So just for the quiz later, those four R's are runway, road, rail, and river. The other asset, which we haven't been able to come up with an R for yet, is our water. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Memphis Sands Aquifer sits beneath our, um, beneath our feet just now. 58 trillion gallons of clear, abundant groundwater. That's a huge asset, particularly for these medical companies, uh, St. Jude, Levon, or many others. The cost of doing business in a place like California, just because of the, of the water purification process, would be millions more a week for those hospitals. So this is another really big asset we have here in Memphis. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Chamber, our partners at Memphis Tomorrow, and uh, our partners at the city, at EDGE, which is our incentive granting arm, as well as Epicenter, which I'll talk about a little later, embarked on a new strategy for business growth and recruitment. We were talking about how we could go and make sure that we're not only growing jobs, but we're growing, growing quality jobs that can offer people um, a quality of life. And so through that work, we've identified five key industries, um, key industry clusters that we'll focus on. Those are agribusiness and technology. I always like to say I have a tractor icon here. This should really be a drone, but I tried to make a drone icon and it just looks like a blip on my screen. So you get a tractor. Uh, medical innovation, device manufacturing, of course, transportation, logistics, and distribution. We are America's distribution center. That's really important. Advanced manufacturing and corporate and professional services. Now the key to these is that we're stringing together a lot of assets and trying to support the growth of these industries because they offer higher wage jobs. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about a couple of these so you can hear a little more about that job recruitment strategy. From that agribusiness piece, uh, we really are positioning Memphis as the Silicon Valley of agriculture. Uh, our deep history in agriculture, again, um, is, is very strong. When you match that with our, our uh, world-class water supply and our transportation network, you really get something exciting. Uh, in fact, because we are the capital of the Mississippi Delta, we sit right on top of 100 miles in every direction, some of the most fertile farmland uh, in the world. And um, that has a lot of benefits, uh, particularly in this more innovative economy. Uh, every major crop in the US can be accessed within a three hour drive of Memphis. Now again, when we talked about being that metropolitan center, 
this is really important for those agriculture innovation companies. What has happened over the last several years is that those companies have traditionally been located on the coast in Silicon Valley, and they were coming up with great technologies, but they weren't being adopted because they weren't being tested with the farmers working alongside. Uh, lots of smart companies like Indigo Ag realized that if they could get to the middle of the country, if they could get closer to that farmland and develop relationships with partners and farmers, they could get that technology adopted faster. And so you see places like Memphis really starting to reap the benefits of that. Uh, you just see for some context, just in Shelby County, we have over 400 farms, almost 82,000 acres of land. And that accounts for just in 2008, which is an old statistic, uh, almost $32 million of market products that go to market here from our region. To support the growth of this industry and the jobs that it's gonna create and the talent that it's going to bring here and grow here, we have a startup accelerator called Ag Launch that's housed out at AgriCenter. Uh, it's really aimed at growing and attracting ag tech startups. And they really focus on value chains, building those collaborative relationships with farmer networks. Um, and they're also really intentionally inclusive. You'll hear me talk a lot about diversity. This is another area where Memphis has such an opportunity coming out of not only the COVID crisis, but also some of the civil unrest that we've seen in other cities. Uh, we're hearing more and more companies who are really interested in finding markets that can help them address their diversity and inclusion goals. Memphis is a great market for that. In fact, in the state of Tennessee, we are one of the most diverse cities. So we think that that's really going to help us as we move forward. Uh, from an agricultural perspective, um, these startups are not just Memphis-born startups. They're startups from all across the world who are coming to Memphis to go through the Ag Launch Accelerator program. So again, we're not just attracting jobs from the top and just growing the companies that exist here, but we're also facilitating the growth of new startups so that we can build the economy there. Another fun thing that we, a lot of people don't know about that happens in Memphis is Crisania on the Delta. It was formerly known as Davos on the Delta. Every year, 300 world leaders from food and agriculture come together, entrepreneurs, innovators, visionaries, here in Memphis to talk about the world's health food crisis and how to solve it, how to innovate in that space. That conference happens here in Memphis each year. Uh, just a little snapshot of some of the education institutions, um, the people that we're, we're educating to go into some of these agriculture jobs are coming again from that 400 mile radius. In fact, we've had over a 50% uh, increase in graduates related to those agricultural fields. I'll also touch on medical innovation, of course, with St. Jude, Le Bonner, UT Health Science Center here. We've got a naturally fertile ground for some of the innovations in medical uh, technology. But we're also um, well known for our orthopedic uh, companies. In fact, we're the second largest orthopedic city in the country. Over 47 medical device companies have a presence here. Uh, that's really because of our logistics infrastructure. Those medical device companies can put those great jobs here in Memphis because we can get those products out to market first thing in the morning. And that's a huge asset uh, to these medical technology companies. Just like agriculture, we're supporting this industry, not just by attracting and growing our existing companies, but by growing from the ground up. Zero to 510 is a medical device accelerator here in Memphis. It's been named a top 25 accelerator in the US for the past three consecutive years. Uh, and they've already launched six new medical device companies. Most recently, Sweet Bio, a uh, wound care management uh, company, got FDA clearance. So again, we're adding those jobs and growing those companies here in Memphis. Innova is an early stage venture capital fund. It was founded in BioWorks. It's rolling into Epicenter, which we'll talk about briefly also. Uh, again, this is meant to help grow those bioscience and agriculture companies. So we're able to support that growth really strategically. Move Hire is a program, a tuition-free tuition skills development and training program that we work with the state to execute here in Memphis. It is completely free training that can help prepare workers for very lucrative jobs in the medical device manufacturing industry. In fact, uh, some of those jobs pay upwards of $80,000 a year, and that training is completely free in our market. These are the types of initiatives that are really attractive to companies that are looking at Memphis. We talked about um, that attraction piece and we've been quite successful in that. Uh, you see here just a couple of the big announcements that we've had over the last two years. I'll call your attention specifically to Prospero Health, which is one of our latest and greatest. Um, 
one of our latest and greatest companies to locate in Memphis. They are a telehealth uh, company and just interestingly so innovative. They had a two year plan for scaling up in the past six months. They have grown their business very rapidly to meet the changing needs of telehealth. And we expect that job number to continue to grow with companies like Prospero. But it's not just about attracting new investment. It's also about building those existing businesses. And what you see here are just a handful of the investments that the companies and, and organizations here in Memphis have been making to expand their footprint. St. Jude is building a $400 million research tower on its campus. FedEx Logistics is taking over the Gibson Guitar Factory downtown uh, and turning it into its one of a kind, very unique world headquarters um, and many others as well. We also have several projects underway, particularly downtown that we think are gonna be really vital um, to our success moving forward. One Beale, the Walk, which was formerly known as Union Row and the Clipper, are going to add not only um, a way to connect walkably some of the, the separated nodes of our downtown, but they're also gonna add some much needed class A office space to our mix downtown. That's gonna be really critical to our recruitment efforts to get those uh, higher wage technology companies that we talked about earlier um, to, to come and, and be part of the Memphis ecosystem. Uh, a lot of companies when they are, a lot of regions when they talk about economic development success, really measure that success by the number of cranes in the sky. Uh, we do as well, but we have built a world-class reputation uh, in adaptive reuse, which is really the reimagining of spaces and places. We think this is a really important part of our business story as well, because it's very unique and cool to Memphis. Uh, and we anticipate that the next generation wants to see this type of innovative office environment. Um, even some of the, uh, the things that you see here, like the Tennessee Brewery Project, um, have gotten international recognition because they're, they're really community-led efforts to highlight um, and, and reuse a really cool and neat space. Tactical urbanism is another big trend that Memphis gets a lot of national and international attention around. This is Broad Avenue Arts District, um, and it is really well known for this tactical urbanism, which is just a planner, an urban planner terminology for uh, when the community revitalizes an area or sparks the catalyzation of a revitalization of an area. Now, I do not condone this, but what happened here is that the business and shop owners in Broad Avenue a couple of years ago wanted to make their, their district more vibrant. And so what they did was um, get paint buckets and they started to paint bike lanes and they started to sort of build some character and have some street festivals and really took it upon themselves to create an exciting environment in their community. We talked a lot about big investments and companies and, and initiatives, but I also like to talk about what we do for small business in this market. Uh, we've gotten a lot of accolades for that, in fact. Uh, in 2017, American Express uh, said Memphis was the number one city for women-owned business growth. We've been named a top three metro for Black-owned businesses. We're also a top market for first-round funding for female-led startups. And we've built an unbelievable, um, an unbelievable ecosystem for entrepreneurship here in Memphis. Um, as an initiative of the Greater Memphis Chambers Chairman Circle, three years ago, we stood up Epicenter, which is an uh, meant to be the hub of the Memphis entrepreneur movement. Uh, this, uh, this organization led by the fearless Leslie Lynn Smith has um, created programs and initiatives to really boost up our small business owners and entrepreneurs. And what we love most about the success of this program is not only have they served 600 entrepreneurs and raised over $51 million in capital for those entrepreneurs, but the entrepreneurs they're serving look like our city. In fact, 400 of those 600 entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs of color and 350 are females. Uh, this is a really strategic move by our market because diversity is so important. And Silicon Valley has had a very difficult time figuring out how to get more women and minorities involved in entrepreneurship. It's been so challenging, in fact, that two years ago, Steve Case from AOL brought an actual busload of investors to Memphis to look at what we've been doing here in Memphis because they wanted to know how we started to create more diversity in our ecosystem. This is an area where we think we're gonna to continue to garner more and more national attention and attract more and more talents. So we're very, very proud of this work. I'll touch on education and talent because this is a, another critical part of growing those jobs and building that workforce. 
in that in our region we have over 45 colleges and universities which seems crazy but lots of students to educate here over 60,000 we've got 35 technical colleges and and Tennessee is part of that free community college initiative which we're really starting to see pay off um, in in the output of our workforce just a few of the colleges we have right here in our metro area I'm going to highlight University of Memphis for a couple of reasons uh, one is that um, there has been such tremendous investment there over the years. Uh, in fact, they embarked a couple of years ago on um, getting Carnegie One research status. Carnegie One is the highest designation of research for an institution. It's really critical not only for the prestige of the university, but for recruitment efforts as well, because companies want to live in a market where they can partner with university resources for their research and for other needs, not just that talent pipeline. In the state of Tennessee, there is only one other Carnegie One public university, and that is the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, for perspective, the state of Mississippi has three Carnegie One public universities. So this is a really critical designation. I'm happy to announce that the University of Memphis is on track to get that Carnegie One designation as early as next year. Uh, and we're really excited for that to come online uh, because we think that that's gonna really um, elevate what we can do in terms of a recruitment and retention perspective. They've also launched the University of Memphis Research Foundation Research Foundation Research Park, say that five times fast, um, which is a really innovative partnership to build companies on campus and let students work for that for those companies at the same time. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, the um, the uh, free community college and free college initiative through Tennessee Promise. Um, that program is, has been underway for a while. And what we were starting to see is that while we were getting higher enrollments in our universities, over 50% of the students at the University of Memphis were Pell Grant eligible students. And so we were seeing just a drop off in those students um, over time. They weren't getting all the way through. And with a little more insight, what the university learned is that oftentimes while their school was paid for, they didn't have money left over for their living expenses. So they were stringing together two or three jobs. Our corporate partners have stepped in and really helped address that in, with innovative public-private partnerships. For example, FedEx put a call center on site at the University of Memphis that allows students to get real world experience by working one single job right on campus. Uh, it helps create a tighter connection with FedEx and the university. Um, and it also gives those students real world experience as well as a paycheck. Um, and we're already starting to see great dividends from that program. And we're seeing more companies like Green Mountain Technology and Sweet Bio put a flag in the ground at the University of Memphis and do the same thing. We think that's gonna pay spades, not only for our recruitment, but for our retention of companies and talent in this market. We have all kinds of great partnerships like the one that I just referenced and I told uh, the team earlier that I could talk for hours. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, just know that there are some amazing public partnership, public private partnerships happening in Memphis right now to really make sure that our future is bright. One of those is Upskill 901, which is an initiative that the Chamber launched last year in partnership with many of our universities, many of our clergy members here in Memphis and many of our uh, work service providers. The goal of this initiative is very ambitious. It is to upskill 10,000 Memphians in three years. Um, at one event, just one snapshot of the success of this initiative, we had over almost 3,000 individuals interviewed on site for job opportunities. More than 350 applicants placed online applications. Um, and we placed uh, over 100 people just from that one initiative really excited about this type of work because it's quite unprecedented in our market for both the public private and the clergy um, and government to work together for an initiative of this scale to really help elevate our workforce. I also always call out the great municipal schools that we have out in our suburban areas but I also like to talk a little bit about what's happened with Shelby County Schools over the last couple of years. In 2017 I, I uh, I think $90 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation ended that was de dedicated to improving the effectiveness, effectiveness of our state's largest public school system. Uh, we're already starting to see that effort pay off. Um, in Shelby County Schools today, there are more than 12,000 students enrolled in one of their 40 optional programs, and that program has a 100% graduation rate. 
really competitive ACT score averages. We have 37 top rated reward schools for perspective, that's three times as many as we had in 2017. We have the only dual language immersion program in the state of Tennessee in a public school, as well as three international baccalaureate programs. Why is this important? Uh, because when we're recruiting a company here, we want to be able to tell a story of options. If you are a, a family with children, we want you to feel comfortable that we can offer you both public and private education options in a variety of settings. Um, we also want to be able to tell a good training story. And we're really proud of the work that Shelby County Schools has done with their college career and technical education uh, training uh, program. For those of you that are um, 40 or older, uh, you might know this as VOTEC, vocational school. Um, they have over 40 programs tied to in-demand career pathways and the chamber and our chairman circle works very closely with Shelby County Schools CCTE programs to better align the training programs they have today with the types of jobs that are in the market. Just a year and a half into that program, I can tell you that it's, it's paying off in spades. In fact, you'll see here that in 2017, over 200, about 250 students were awarded a career ready certificate at the completion of their degree in Shelby County Schools when they finished their senior year. Uh, they set an ambitious goal in 2019 of getting 1,000 degrees awarded and they doubled that goal. Uh, in fact, over the summer, they increased it even more. So we're really proud of this work and we know that it's gonna be really important in accelerating us moving forward. I did wanna just share a snapshot. When we talk to companies, uh, we usually talk about all the different neighborhoods, the suburban areas of our market, but I'm gonna just talk a little bit about downtown because there's some key statistics we think that are important. Downtown's really become a beacon for young talent. Uh, 38103 last year had the largest population of 20 to 40 year olds of any zip code in Tennessee. That's really significant when you think about Knoxville and Nashville and the educational institutions that they have there. In fact, 38103 proportionately had one of the highest concentrations of millennials of any zip code in the US. It's also a highly educated uh, zip code. Um, the, the, um, it's the fastest growing neighborhood in Shelby County, very walkable, very bikeable. These statistics that you see in the upper right hand are becoming more and more important to companies when they're evaluating neighborhoods. And you're probably seeing them become important to um, not only companies, uh, but also to the folks that you're, um, that you're uh, trying to place in housing. Um, there's about $5 billion worth of new plan and planned projects underway just in downtown Memphis. Of course, we talk about this suburban neighborhoods. I'm not gonna go into as much depth with them today because we don't have as much time. But I do wanna touch quickly on um, some infrastructure items. One is that we really like to talk about the fact that in Memphis, 30 miles is 30 minutes. When you're talking to a company thinking of moving out of a densely populated area like DC or uh, Chicago, this is um, music to their ears. Um, our average commute time is about 23 minutes in the MSA and about 20 in the city as a whole. We also have about 18,000 people that commute from Nashville to Memphis about three times a week. So again, um, as things begin to change, those opportunities may see more movement to our city. Uh, a couple of other infrastructure updates that are really critical. As you know, the airport is undergoing a, a $200 million um, renovation right now um, with lots of, new, lots of new flights, lots of new concourse uh, opportunities. We think this is gonna be really important to our story as we move forward. We have been joking a little bit in COVID that our lack of international flights has actually worked in our favor during COVID because it made us a less risk, risk exposed market. So um, we'll just have that with a caveat as a slight positive for now. Our convention center is something we, we did wanna to touch on. Um, it's a $200 million project underway on time uh, moving forward. This is an, a good example of something that we think is also going to be an asset for us because this was a project that wasn't online. It was intended to be off the books right now. So we're not um, losing revenue that we were anticipating. We think compared to some of our peers in this convention space, uh, while sad, this is going to work to our advantage because we're going to have a new shiny building coming online um, just as things are starting to calm down again. And we think that'll provide us some great visitors opportunity. Connectivity is something else we really like to tell in our story because it's a real area that we've improved. In fact, in 2008, Memphis was named one of the worst cities for bi cyclists and pedestrians by Bicycling Magazine. Um, we're consistently now in the top 20, which is really great. We have over 60 miles of bike lanes, off-road trails, and protected pathways. 
Um, that connectivity has been really important in COVID. Um, we've seen big number jump ups in all of our public spaces. Um, and we think um, this is one of the shifts people are gonna be looking for coming out of COVID. They're gonna be looking for markets where they have more of an outdoor, um, more of those outdoor amenities. And we certainly do have those here in Memphis. Um, this is interesting. Um, transit has always been a little bit of a thorn in our side while MATA is working hard um, on their new transit plan. We don't have the type of transit infrastructure that many of our peer cities do, but we have been innovative in this space as well. You see scooters, ride share services, bike lanes, the trolley, all these other amenities to really help connect different areas of our city. Um, and we do think that um, coming out of COVID, there's gonna be real shifts in how people view public transit. So there may be some more reimagining coming out of this moving forward. I always like to touch on safety because I know that this is one that um, people get asked about quite a bit, particularly during relocation projects. Um, the research that we have from the Memphis Brain Initiative is quite promising. While Memphians feel that uh, people may associate crime with our city, it's really not what people outside of our region think about when they think about Memphis. They think about our music, they think about soul, um, and overall they're just interested in our market. So I do like to just note a couple of public safety um, notes, and I will send some updated figures here. I think this one um, might be a couple of months old, but our, our police department is nearing about 2,100 officers. Um, we are gonna fall short of our 2300 officer goal for the end of 2020. Um, with COVID and other things that are happening, it's very difficult to recruit police officers right now, um, but, but that force is continuing to grow. The budget for the police department has been increased. Um, our 911 call answer rates have uh, really decreased over the last two years. This is another thing when we get a request from a company that's looking at Memphis, these are the types of statistics they wanna know what's the average 911 time, and we've really been able to reduce that down through some really um, innovative efforts at City Hall. Our violent crime is down. Um, we're gonna look for new COVID numbers and, and, and update this, but overall those trends are down, um, and they do continue to be sort of um, segregated into parts of the city, but, but we are seeing those overall numbers come down, um, and, and hopefully there'll be some initiatives and some work done to continue to bring, bring those numbers down. Um, I also like to note that our Memphis Animal Service has achieved almost a 90% save rate despite a huge increase in intake from 2018. Um, people love their animals and our city has really rallied around um, our animal services and making sure that we're able to offer top-notch services in that area as well. I always like to close by talking about giving back. Um, Memphis has been once again named the most charitable city in the U.S. by the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Those numbers just came out again this year. Uh, in fact, we're so innovative in the charitable giving space that we have companies like Volunteer Odyssey that work with our corporate partners to actually place their employees in volunteer opportunities. When we talk about attracting those millennials and those Gen Z folks, this is really critical to our story because they wanna live in a market where they know that they can make their mark and make a difference. And so when I go talk to employers and their, and their employees about, about moving to Memphis, they really like to hear about this, uh, this sort of philanthropic DNA that we have built into the, uh, built into the DNA of our city because it really differentiates us. People feel that Memphis is a place that they can make their mark and they can get invested here in Memphis, which we love to hear. Uh, so I will just close out quickly, um, and I know we'll do some Q&A in a moment, but just follow the chamber on social media for more. Um, I like to put out lots of facts and tidbits all the time. Um, so you can follow the, so the chamber social media accounts here. And then my social media accounts here, it's April with a Y, Child's Potter, our Memphis ACP on most platforms. Um, you can get your daily dose of all things Memphis from there. Uh, thank you again for letting me just power talk to you. I can't see your faces, so I hope that you have enjoyed this. And I'm going to turn it over to Katie for a little bit of Q&A. Um, yeah, thank you so much, April. Um, I, uh, I have a couple of questions um, in the chat that um, some, well, first of all, I do want to say um, for everyone who's watching, we have been recording this and it will be available on Mars YouTube channel. So please, um, you know, 
go to our YouTube channel, share it with the agents in your office. It's so much good information. This is the second time for me to see your presentation. And I just, I get so much out of it every time I see it and I just love it. So, um, but a couple of the questions that we have, um, one was, um, you mentioned, you showed a slide of the bike map. Is there somewhere where that can be accessed to the public um, that you can let us know? And um, also um, there's several, uh, one person asked, uh, they had like several clients that are moving to Memphis for work and they're wanting to rent for a year uh, to make sure they like their job in the area and all that. Is there a uh, apartment collateral piece uh, that people can go to to find like the apartments that are available in, in the Memphis area? Um, sometimes it's hard to get answers, I guess, from apartment complexes. Do you know? So on the bike map first, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so on the bike map, the answer to that is probably yes, um, but I'm not sure where it is. So I'll send it to you guys if you want to be able to just to send it out and then I'll make sure that's updated on our website somewhere. Um, okay. Well. Are you going to make, um, I know like this is, uh, like I said, this was recorded and people can, you know, tap into this whenever they want, but are you uh, able to make your slides available to the attendees today or is that? too hard to transfer. <laughs> I know it's probably like a really big file. So it is a huge file. I'll send you a link to where it can be viewed online. My only ask is that you not download it because I think a couple of the photos in there are are things that I may I may have pulled off the internet. So I don't want to get anybody in trouble. <laughs> right. So, um, on the apartment guide we do have some partners that offer those so I will see what we um, can do and I'll I'll just send you a couple of links. Okay. One other note that I wanted to, um, I didn't mention the presentation is that last year we launched the Greater Memphis Relocation Guide, which is a great um, print piece um, that um, I know we're sending to you guys. We've, we've put the printing of it on hold, hold. It will get printed later this fall, we hope, the 2020 edition. Um, but it's a great resource that really showcases our market from a livability perspective and talks about the whole city and all the, the things that are underway. I'll put a link to that in the chat so you can see the online version of it. And we'll also, when we get those printed, get those to you guys. Okay. Um, do you uh, know when the reno renovations for uh, the pinch districts are supposed to start? Um, I, well, they're happening now. Um, so there's, there, I don't know how many, I haven't been downtown. I've been working home since, from home <laughs> since March uh, 16th. I, this is week. This is month six officially. This week starts month six of working from home. So I don't go downtown very often, but each time that I have gone downtown, um, there is a ton of construction that has been completed during COVID. We actually did not stop construction during the, the shutdowns um, and the shelter in place order. So uh, quite a bit of the things that were happening have really accelerated their growth during that time. Um, so much of the renovations are underway in the Pinch District, a lot that's happening around St. Jude. Um, some of the bigger projects are, were intended to start coming online in 2021. So far, nothing has schedule-wise changed. Some of the projects like Union Row, which is now called The Walk, have scaled back a little, but the production schedule is mostly the same. Um, um, we were talking about earlier, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, I was just looking at <laughs> Uh, we were talking earlier about the convention center. Do you know the timeline for that completion by any chance? Or, I mean, I know it's not always on schedule, but I'm no, just curious. I do not know the completion date, but I'll get that. Um, that was one of the things I made a note about. Um, it, is on, it is on schedule. I believe it's supposed to come online at the end of next year, but I will confirm that. Or maybe the end of this year. It's very hard to remember which year we're in now. Um, it's... <laughs> um, yeah, but it is actually, it is on the same schedule it was on before, so we haven't had any real significant delays. And I'll tell you that the delays, for what it's worth, have any delays that we've had have not been a result of ordinances or work stoppage. They've really been more of an issue of supply because there were some supply chain disruptions that have happened because of COVID right. um, that have been a little bit challenging. Uh, you also mentioned the uh, Chamber newsletter. How can uh, folks at home that want to sign up for the Chamber newsletter do that? Uh, you can send me an email okay. at, a, at apotter at memphischamber.com and we can get you signed up for that. It comes out every Monday and has just a, a smorgasbord of information. Um, the other thing is, again, following us on our social channels, that's a really good, especially LinkedIn is a really good way to get a lot of these 
more business focus and recruitment type messages that we put out. Um, so I have a, um, a question that I wanted to ask. Um, so could you tell our members more about what other opportunities Memphis, ha Memphis has to offer as we move forward? Absolutely. Um, I think I touched a little bit on right. um, the diversity piece, which is really interesting. So um, much like when someone's choosing a home, um, companies have a list of site selection and location criteria that they use. And we're constantly trying to monitor the shifts in those criteria and what people are looking at. And interestingly, um, a lot more companies are interested in, in diversity and inclusion. And that is something that we think is really going to help us the state of Tennessee gets a huge, huge amount of, um, of inquiries and leads from companies looking to relocate because of our business climate in Tennessee. Um, and of the cities and the places that you can go in, in the state of Tennessee, Memphis really does offer that diversity. So that's one thing. The other thing that I'll say, and I think I touched on this, is that um, we're, we're seeing already a really significant shift for a long time, we heard over and over again, millennials aren't gonna have families, millennials aren't gonna wanna move to the suburbs, millennials are gonna wanna live in micro apartments, um, millennials are aliens, and they'll never be normal, you know, all of these crazy things. And what we're really seeing, even before COVID, is that most millennials are in their mid to late 30s now. Um, they really are hitting a lot of those traditional milestones, they're just doing a little later. Mm -hmm. And um, now with COVID accelerating some of the awareness of um, what it's really like to live in a small state space or a really, really dense place, um, you're starting to really see some folks rethink that. And so we think that for Memphis, that is going to play out quite well for us, uh, particularly as that digital revolution happens and there are um, less and less need to be tethered to a place. Um, we think we can take advantage of some of that and particularly with what you all do every day being able to sell people on the notion that Memphis offers you such a wide range of housing stock. You can live inside the city limits and have a big uh, historic house with a yard and um, lots of bedrooms, or you can have a small apartment, or you can have um, all of these different things. You can live out in the exterior suburbs and have land. That's just unheard of in most cities that have an NBA team or that have um, a world-class Broadway theater. Uh, we have these amenities, and I think as Memphians, sometimes we don't recognize how fortunate we are. But I think from a housing perspective, some of that is really going to be elevated as people. We're already seeing some migration away from Nashville. We think that yeah. some of that's going to continue. So we've got kind of two big, that diversity piece, as well as that piece of the type of housing that we have and how we can elevate that are gonna be real opportunities for us. Absolutely. Um, we have actually a couple of other uh, chamber related questions coming in. Um, so does the chamber have grants or funding for nonprofits improving or using a building for a particular area? We do not. So uh, people, I should have mentioned this earlier. So the chamber um, is unique. The government this chamber is unique in that we are completely privately funded. Um, about seven years ago, we stopped receiving any public funding from the city and state. We did that like several metropolitan area chambers across the country so that we could strengthen our advocacy efforts, really be able to stand up and say, whether it's we need to not raise taxes or, or whatever those things are to really be able to elevate that policy piece. And that's been really important. Um, so we are also a nonprofit organization. So we don't we don't technically grant anything. We certainly have lots of ways to connect people to opportunities and many of our members are nonprofit organizations. Um, so I'm happy to share, um, you know, if you, if somebody wants to send me a, a, a link in chat or an email, we're happy to connect you to those resources as well. And um, can you recommend or discuss how um, people at home would be able to join the chamber? Absolutely. So we have six different levels of investment. Um, we like to call our, our members investors because at the end of the day, what you're doing is not just um, participating in, in the chamber to network and to do those things. You're really in